Okay, I think then we can start. So let me welcome you all to the third uh, GINA online seminar. And before we start, again, I want to uh, remind you to please mute your microphones. And if you have questions, uh, we have a question session in the end of the talk. If you have questions, you can put them into the chat. Uh, or you indicate in the end to me that you want to ask a question and then uh, I can moderate it. So today our speaker is Jonas Lipuna. Uh, he did his uh, bachelor from 2008 to 2012 at the University of Manitoba in Canada. And since 2012, he's a PhD student at Caltech. And he will tell uh, us today about the R process nuclear synthesis in neutron star mergers. So yeah. Hi, thank you for the introduction and also thank you for the invitation to, to speak here. And so I've listed my collaborators here and I want to especially highlight Luke Roberts with whom I've done basically most of the work that I'm showing you here. So let's just, um, here's a quick outline of the talk. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to the office and sort of neutron star mergers in general. Then a very quick overview of the science, which is the nuclear reaction that we're using. And finally, I want to spend. I want to spend. Okay, I'm here. Okay, okay. I'm here. Could you please mute the microphone? All right, let's see how it is now. All right, and so in the third, I want to spend most of the time on uh, just showing some results. On it. Find a neutron stars and neutron star black hole mergers. So let's start out with just a quick introduction. I'm sorry, our... Adam, can you also mute your microphone? Sorry, so, sorry. Ah, oh, yeah, very good. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So the, here, these are the observed abundances that we see in our solar system as a function of mass of mass number. I'm sure most of you have seen this plot, and as you know. Um, we can make all the elements sort of lighter than the iron peak, which is shown in gray here. We can make uh, those in stars or stellar explosions, but for anything heavier, we need some kind of neutron capture process. And the one that I want to focus on today is the R process, the rapid neutron capture process. And this is just like a 30 second recap of how it works. So we have some seed nucleus. In this example, it's copper 65. We capture neutrons on it very rapidly. So we move to the right on this chart of nuclides. Then at some point we have beta decay and then we capture more neutrons. And so this way we can very quickly build up very neutron rich nuclides. Um, and of course, this is sort of, this is a cartoon. This neutron rip line is actually much further away from stability. But then in the end, uh, once the neutron source sh shuts off, we're just left with these very neutron rich nuclides and then they all decay back to stability. And that's how we create heavy elements through the, um, through the R process. And so this whole process, like how it works on a nuclear physics level, has been known for, for quite a while. But what is still maybe an open, slightly an open question is where does it actually happen astrophysically? And there's sort of two leading candidates for where this R process can happen. And one, and that's sort of the historic candidate, is core collapse supernovae, which um, are fairly frequent in, in our universe. So the rate is between like a few thousand to 10,000 per million years per sort of Milky Way type galaxy. And then they can eject about a few times 10 to the minus four solar masses. And the ejector tends to be mildly neutron rich. So an electron fraction, which is the fraction of uh, protons divided by the total number of baryons um, is usually a little over 0.4. So it's mildly neutron rich. And as we'll see this actually, or as other people have shown, this is, turns out to be not neutron rich enough to make the full R process. And so it seems like this sort of scenario where core collapse supernovae are sort of the dominant source for R process elements, especially the very, the very heavy ones in the, in the second and third peak, um, is sort of disfavored at the moment. Um, and so then the other possible site is neutron star mergers. And there we have two possibilities. We can have two neutron stars that emerge or a neutron star and black hole. And the rates there are, are a lot more uncertain and they're also more rare. So between one and a thousand times uh, per million years in, in the Milky Way. And of course, I'm sure you've all heard that yesterday, LIGO announced that they for the first time detected gravitational waves and that was from a binary black hole merger. Um, but you know, we can be very confident now that very soon, maybe this year, or certainly in the next couple of years, we will also see gravitational wave signals from binary neutron stars or even neutron star black hole mergers, and that will put a much better constraint on those rates. And so, the, so these events, the neutron star mergers, are um, more infrequent, but they usually eject more mass. So 
around a percent of a solar mass and there's there's sort of a big discrepancy in or a big spread in different simulations and we'll go through that in the next couple of slides um, but the, the nice thing is the ejecta from neutron star mergers tends to be very neutron rich so we can get ye of all the way down to 0.05 um, and then we have sort of a spread in y from 0.05 to almost symmetric, but in the, the fraction of material that is very neutron rich will very easily make the full R process. Now, this scenario also has some issues, um, although it's not clear whether there really are issues. And, and one thing is that um, we see very old stars in our galaxy that formed very early on when the galaxy formed, and they already have R process material in them. And so that means whatever source of our process material we have must have turned on very early on, just after the galaxy formed. And the problem with neutron star mergers is they take a long time, like many tens or hundreds of millions of years to actually for the first merger to happen because the gravitational in spiral is very slow. And then also there's this issue or potential issue of mixing because if we have few events that eject a large amount of mass rather than many events with a small amount of mass, which will be the supernovae, but the neutron star mergers are relatively few events that eject a large amount of mass, and then this has to be mixed with the interstellar material so that we get sort of a fairly uniform abundance pattern that we see in our galaxy. And um, so these, these here are some references of where papers that mention this problem, but actually more many recent galactic chemical evolution models they show that, okay, maybe this is not so much of a problem if you have a more sophisticated galactic chemical evolution model. But I think at this point, there's still no clear consensus in the literature. So this is, these are sort of the, the challenges that the neutron star mergers face right now. So let's, um, I want to talk about uh, different types of ejecta that we get from neutron star mergers. And I will just start by showing a movie of what it looks like. And for this, I have to share a different window, so bear with me one second. Okay, can you guys see a new uh, plot with like basically a, a blue square? Okay, good. So this is a movie by David Rodice, who's run many different neutron star, binary neutron star mergers. And here we're basically looking at, this is the equatorial plane. We're looking at the two neutron stars from above, and the two red dots are neutron stars. And what we're plotting here is just, uh, density and so I'll run this movie and you see the neutron stars orbiting and they're getting closer and closer due to gravitational wave emission and then they get deformed and now just before they merge there's sort of this tidal tail of material that's being flung out into space and now they just collapse to a black hole all right so this first type of a check down oh, I have to go back to the slide window uh, where is it? Ah, here. Okay, so back to the slide. So this first type of ejecta is called tidal tails. And what happens is as the neutron stars get close, tidal um, forces disrupt the neutron stars and they basically, they rip each other apart. And a, a small amount, you know, between 10 to the minus four to a few percent of the solar mass uh, in this tidal tail can get ejected. And that tends to be fairly neutron rich by, you know, all the way down to 0.05. Um, and in, uh, in neutron star black hole mergers, there's a much bigger spread in the uh, in this tidal tail ejector because uh, it depends on the relative sizes of the neutron star and the black hole. So if the black hole is too big relative to the neutron star, it will just sort of swallow the neutron star hole. On the other hand, if they're about the same size, then it can, get, it can disrupt the neutron star very violently and actually produce almost like up to 10% solar mass ejector. And so I have some quick movies for that as well. Uh, let's see. So here, the first one, this is, oops. Okay. So this is a movie by, uh, um, Garcia. And so here the left, this is the neutron star, the black hole, obviously, or the black thing here, obviously is the black hole. And so now we'll see how uh, the black hole will tear the neutron star apart and actually lead to a lot of a check down. And so here we only get one tidal tail, but we get a lot of ejects, and then in the end, we get sort of this accretion disk around, which was also important. And then just one more movie to show you the other case where the neutron stars get swallowed whole. And this is a movie by Francois Foucault. And so here we have a mass ratio that the black hole is six times as massive as the neutron star. And so 
It's a very big black hole compared to the neutron star. And the neutron star still gets disrupted, but basically the entire disruption happens inside the event horizon of the black hole, and so there's no ejector at all, really. Okay, back to this. And actually, I, I hope that you see those movies fine through the, uh, through, the com through the webcast system. All right, back to the slides. So, so that was the tidal tail ejector. Then there's another type of dynamic, dynamical ejector that's shown in the figure on the right, and that only happens when you have two neutron stars. And as they collide, they collide with almost the speed of light. And then in the interface where they collided, they basically squeeze out mass from that interface. And so that's another, another way that you can sort of get this dynamical ejector that happens right at the merger. And then as I alluded to, um, after a binary neutron star merger, uh, we might end up with a hot hypermassive neutron star that lives for you know, some tens of milliseconds and an accretion disk or a torus of material forms around it, or we might end up with a, if the, if the neutron stars are heavy, then we, if they collapse to a black hole directly, or if in the case of a black hole neutron star merger, we get a black hole and then there's torus of material around it. And from this disk, we can also drive an outflow through some different mechanisms. One is neutrino driven wind, that's sort of shown schematically on the left, where the hypermassive neutron star um, deleptinizes and emits a lot of neutrinos, or also the disk itself, actually, because it's, it's pretty hot, can emit neutrinos, and they can drive sort of a wind off of the surface. Uh, but also at later times, uh, viscous heating inside the disk, or even alpha recombination inside the disk, um, can drive an outflow off of the surface. And so and the figure on the right is just a... Um, a slice plot of one half of the torus from, from an actual hydro simulation. And this outflow tends to be a little bit lower, so usually around a few times 10 to the minus three solar masses. And also because it's heavily irradiated by neutrinos and heated up and sort of occurs at a later time, um, the, the neutrino radiation increases the YE off the, off the outflow. So we usually get an electron fraction above 0.2 or so, and then it goes up all the way up to, to symmetry. So those are the different outflows in uh, neutron star mergers. And then in all of these, our process nucleosynthesis can happen. And so we also, one other thing that you know, is, a, is a big thing is, okay, what does it actually look like if, this R, if such an R process nucleosynthesis event happened, can we see it? And uh, we think we should be able to see it because we produce all these very neutron rich nuclides and they're extremely radioactive. And then they, you know, over the time scale of hours and days, they decay back to stability and that heats up the material and so it makes it glow. And so this radioactive powered transient that we expect to be able to see is called a kilonova. And if you know, this really happens and, and we can see it, then we have this potential triple coincidence of events that we, that we expect to see from a neutron, binary neutron star merger. First, we get a gravitational wave signal from the in spiral and the merger. And then if binary neutron star mergers are indeed the progenitor of short gamma ray bursts and the, the jet of the gamma ray burst is being towards us, then you would see a gamma ray burst sort of coincident with the gravitational wave signal. And then we expect to make, we have some, some ejecta, we expect to make the R process in there, and then we should see a kilonova on a time scale of a few days to a week or so. And the optical signature of the kilonova is very heavily dependent on the amount of lanthanides and actinides that are present in the ejecta. Because those elements, they're past the second peak, so lanthanides between the, the second and third peak around a mass of 170 or so, and the actinides are beyond the third peak at a mass of 230 or so. And they have a very complicated um, electron shell structure, and so that means they have a very high line density, and so the opacity, the photon opacity from these elements is extremely high, and it's usually, it's you know, on the order of 100 times the opacity of iron. And because of this high opacity, if, if they're present, we expect to see a very dim transient uh, sort of on a weak time scale. And if, if they're not there, then we expect to see a much brighter transient uh, that's also blue rather than red on time scale of a few days. And so we have two possible detections already of kilonovae. And so the first is, which was actually discovered later in archival data, is from Chir B060614. And so here you can see the, um, the lines here. These are the afterglow you would expect just from pure synchrotron radiation. Um, but then we detected, or other people detected, um, these excesses in infrared and also optical here that are, that are clearly above just the afterglow. And so this is interpreted as a kilonova signature. And the other one, which was discovered first in 2013, 
here again, we just have one data point in the infrared, which is very above the, uh, the afterglow that you would expect. So we potentially discovered it already. These are pretty hard to spot because they're only around for a few days to a week or so, and they're fairly thin. So we really need um, sort of good localization, which we can get from the GRBs. And in the future, once we have a big network of, of gravitational wave detectors, we would also be able to get a localization from gravitational waves. Okay, so this sort of um, concludes the introduction to our process. Now let me quickly talk about Skynet, which is the nuclear reaction network that Luke and I have developed, and we've been using it to investigate how the R process actually happens and what sort of the final abundances and heating rates are that we get out after, you know, depending on the input parameters. And so we usually evolve about 8,000 isotopes and uh, 140,000 nuclear reactions. And the way that the evolution works from, from of the abundances is basically we can write down the first time derivative of each species or of each isotope that we're evol evolving. And then each reaction, nuclear reaction that involves the species will contribute to the change of abundance or the, the time derivative of the abundance of that species. And the way that it contributes is just through the nuclear reaction rate and the other abundances of the reactions that, that, um, are, that are in the entrance channel there. And so then we end up with a huge system of coupled nonlinear ODEs, and we evolve that forward in time. Uh, Skynet also evolves the temperature and entropy because as these nuclear reactions happen, entropy gets released and that, in, that heats up the material and then the temperature feeds back into the nuclear reaction rate because most of these rates are very dependent on temperature. Um, and then the inputs that you need to give Skynet to just sort of run a nucleosynthesis calculation is you need to give it a density versus time, and then also initial conditions, so initial composition, which we usually take to be nuclear statistical equilibrium, and so then it's just determined by an initial entropy or temperature, or and a YE, um, an electron fraction, and then also we need an initial entropy or temperature to just know what the entropy is at the beginning. And so this code is going to be um, open source, we've always been planning to release it, and we just need to sort of package it up nicely and write a code paper, and we're planning on doing this uh, by the summer. And here, just one more quick slide about some additional features that Skynet has. So it includes a Helmholtz equation of state, which we've modified or extended a bit to actually uh, not just include like electrons and, and photons and some representative heavy nuclide species, but we include every single nuclide species in the equation of state that we have in the record. Because at every point in time, we actually know the exact composition, so we might as well use it. And then as I alluded to, we have um, an, an NSC calculator, so we can calculate NSC. And then also, um, one, if, the, um, if the temperature is very high, then basically the abundances are in nuclear statistical equilibrium. And the uh, strong reactions that either create nuclear or photo disassociate them, they're in equilibrium. And so they happen very fast, but they're not changing the abundances because the forward inverse rates are the same. And so then Skynet automatically switches to an NSE evolution mode, where it basically turn off all the strong reactions because they wouldn't change the abundances. But we still keep track of the weak reactions, so any decays that happen, and also the uh, entropy changes through these decays. So we basically, in NSE evolution mode, we just evolve the electron fraction and the entropy. And then once the, uh, the temperature drops, the full network is, is turned back on. And then on the code side, it's written in modern option oriented C++, and uh, we have Python bindings for it, and I'm actually pretty pr proud of these Python bindings because they make the code really easy to use. And so you should really think of Skynet more as a library of different um, tools, and with the Python bindings, you can just, inside a Python script, you can bring these tools together and assemble them into a nucleosynthesis calculation. And so that includes like reading in the reactions, running the network, or setting options for the, for the network. And then also you get another class that you can use in Python where you can look at all the outputs from the nucleus, nucleus synthesis calculation. And then also, um, because it's option-oriented C++, it's very easy to extend. So we already have a different types of reaction classes that, that are included in Skynet. For example, ReactLib reactions or tabulated reactions, which, which are just tabulated as a function of temperature and YE. And then we also have neutrino interactions where you actually specify a neutrino distribution function and then it calculates the actual like capture rates and uh, in like at every at every step um, and because it's option oriented it's pretty easy to extend 
these and they introduce more reaction types. And then finally, there's code to make movies uh, of the nucleosynthesis event, and I will show you some of those in just a moment. All right, so now let's jump into the results. So the first um, I want to talk about is a paper I wrote with Luke where we looked at, we basically did a parameter study of, and um, we, we essentially wanted to look, or mainly wanted to look at in what regions of parameter space do you create those lanthanides and actinides that alter the uh, kilonova light curve and whether that's correlated to the heating rate or not. And so we have three parameters. We have the initial electron fraction, the initial entropy, and then also an expansion time scale, which sort of determines how quickly the density is falling off at early times. And so then we just pick this an analytic density profile and we say, okay, at early times, the density falls off as an exponential with this time scale tau, and then it smoothly transitions to a homologous expansion where the density falls off as t to the minus three, um, which is sort of free streaming. And then if you want this to be smooth, that is really just, you know, one way to do it, and it's, it's shown on the right, and we really end up with just one parameter family of, of density profiles, uh, plus the initial density, of course. Um, and so then the way that we ran this, so we have these three parameters, and then we said, okay, we always start at a temperature of 6 gigakelvin, because then the material is about an NSE, and so we always start from the same condition, and then we just need to find the initial uh, density that corresponds to that, and we also say, okay, we, we are at 6 gigakelvin, we're in an NSE, and so we can calculate NSE with trying out different densities, essentially, it's a root finding problem, until we get to the point where, we, where the initial distribution has the entropy that we specified. And so then we can just run the full our process simulation. And so let me just show you what this looks like. So I'm going to switch windows again. Uh, and now I need to make sure I select the right one. All right. So let me explain what you see here. So the main thing is the chart of nuclides, obviously, with neutrons increasing to the right, protons increasing upwards. And then here, this is the initial distribution of abundances that we have. So you see most of the mass is or most of the abundances are clustered around this um, doubly magic number here in the first peak. Um, these colored bands correspond to bins in the histogram that will pop up down here. The blue curve here is the abundances on the log scale. And then finally, in the upper left corner, we have just temperature density and heating rate as a function of time. And so I will just run this, and the time will, time is on a logarithmic scale, so the time will speed up as the movie goes on. So now neutron capture starts. We're capturing lots of neutrons. We're making elements up to mass like 300 or so. Now neutrons are exhausted and just everything is decaying back to stability. And so after like a few seconds, sort of, you know, all the neutrons are gone. We're just decaying back to stability and it's pretty boring from this point on. I'll just run the first few seconds again. And you can actually nicely see how the R process runs up along the closed neutron shell. So here and here. So this is um, a case where we start out very, very neutron rich. So we start out with an initial electron fraction of 0 0.01. And you can see we very easily, like we make up mass up to 300. And then these nuclides that are so masses, massive, they're unstable to fission, so either neutron-induced fission or spontaneous fission, and so then they get fissioned, and then the fission products capture neutrons again, go out to a mass of 300, get fissioned, and then these fission products capture neutrons again, so we get into this fission cycling. And that's um, because of this fission cycling, as we'll see, uh, the final abundances tend, uh, always work out to be very robust to the initial sort of um, parameters of, of you know, what we get from, from the outflow. So let's switch back to the slides. I can find them. Here we go. Oop. All right. So here's just um, three different final abundance curves. And uh, this is all at the fixed entropy of 10 kb and then expansion time scale of 7 milliseconds. The, first, the case I just showed you is the black curve here with a y of 0.01. The red curve is a y of 0.13. So it's less neutron rich. but you can see the abundances are basically on top of each other. And that's because of this fission cycling that even though it's less neutron rich, we still get into the fission cycling. And so the, the abundances, the second and third peak are essentially identical. The uh, black dots here are the measured or the observed solar R process abundances. And so we match those fairly well. 
Um, and then those, the red band here and the blue bands, these are the lanthanides and actinides, so we produce a lot of these. And, but then if Ye goes even higher, so less neutron rich of, of 0.25, that's the blue curve, suddenly we still make the second peak, but we don't really make anything beyond the second peak here, and so we don't get lanthanides or actinides. Um, we still, but on the other hand, we have sort of an enhancement in the first peak, which is good because we, we do see a lot of abundances in the first peak. And so it seems that very neutron rich ejecta actually does not really produce this first peak because everything goes into the second and third peak. But if you're less neutron rich, then you can produce this first peak here. And so as I here, just, um, I told you about that we wanted to look at this and put a uh, point of view of Kilinoway. And so here's some example light curves, and we, we calculated this light curves with a very simplified gray radiation transport scheme. And again, these are the three cases just from the previous slide. And so very neutron rich, the black and red curves, we get this very dim transient that the peaks on time scale of around a week or so. And then if we're less neutron rich in the blue case, uh, we get a much brighter transient that peaks on a time scale of one or two days. But the really important thing here is the dashed lines, these are the heating rates as a function of time. And they're virtually the same in all three cases. So here it's really the, we, the, the big difference in the light curve is not because the heating rate is different, but because if we make those lanthanides and actinides, the opacity is about 100 times larger. And so then we just, just through radiation transport or the way that radiation leaks out of this high opacity material, that changes the, um, the, the transient so dramatically. It's not the heating rate, it's really just the opacity. So the presence of the lanthanides or actinides is really important to, to predict what the kilonol would look like. And so because we ran a parameter study, we can actually look at um, sort of these quantities as a function of Ye. And so here, again, just this is a fixed entropy and expansion time scale, but now I'm varying Ye on the x-axis from 0.01 to 0.5. And the black line here shows the lanthanide and actinide mass fraction. And so as long as Ye is below a critical value of around 0.25 in this case, they're essentially constant because of this fission cycling. And then in this regime, we get a dim transient. That's the, the pink uh, curve shows the peak luminosity, peaking on a time scale of about six days. And it's fairly cold. So this is in the infrared. But then once actinides and lanthanides go away, and then suddenly the time scale goes up, or the, sorry, the, um, the luminosity goes up. The, the peak time scale is now on the order of a day, and it becomes sort of bluish. Uh, the big oscillations you see here, you see as uh, high YEs. Did somebody on YouTube? All right, so the, the um, oscillations you see at high YEs are because if we have a specific YE, then in the initial NSC distribution, okay, it seems like something we need to be there. I'm hearing some echo. All right. Um, yeah, so if you have a specific, specific YE that matches a nucleus, then the initial NSC distribution is going to be dominated by that nucleus. And, you know, in this case, for example, it happens to be a, an unstable nucleus, so we get a lot of heating and so a huge luminosity, whereas in this case, we have this why we happen to make a very stable nucleus and so we hardly get any heating there. And so those are the, the oscillations there. But then we ran a three-dimensional parameter study so we can look at slice plots from sort of the three-dimensional uh, volume. And so these are YE slices. So on the left column, I'm showing very neutron rich of YE of 0.01. And then the top is lanthanide and actinide mass fraction bottom is heating rate and as a function of entropy on the x-axis and time scale expansion time scale on the y-axis and so as we expect in if we are very neutron rich we sort of make lanthanides and actinides in the majority of the parameter space although there's these two corners where we don't make lanthanides and actinides so that means even at very neutron rich if the entropy is high and the expansion time scale is short we don't make a full R process and that's because in, in these cases here, um, the expansion time scale is so short that the material expands very quickly. And that basically doesn't leave any time for the neutrons to capture onto C nuclei. And so in the end, we just end up with a neutron rich freeze out. So we just have free neutrons in the ejecta and they didn't know our process happened there. And then after like 
10, 15 minutes, all these neutrons decay, and they will make a very bright transient, but a very short one on the time score of a few hours. And so that's, that will be really, really hard to detect. Um, but that's why we see no lanthanides here. And that also has an impact on the heating rate, which is shown at one day. Um, then on the other hand, the other corner, where we have um, a very large expansion time score and short entropy. Let me just show you what happens here. So one more movie, which is this one. All right, so this is now, again, a very, very neutron rich, y 8.01, but a very high, or sorry, very low entropy, but a very short or sorry, long expansion time scale. So the material ex is expanding very slowly. So here's what happens. So we do get neutron capture. We make an R process. We make material up to mass of 300 or so. Oh, and now something happened. We still have neutrons around, so we make another R process, but at that time, at this late time, there's already a lot of decays have happened, and so the YE, sort of when the R process restarts, and it restarts because we get a significant amount of heating because the, dense, like the, the density is falling off so slowly, it remains high for a long time, and then the heating actually pushes the material back into nuclear statistical equilibrium. That's what you saw when it suddenly all went back into the lower left corner. Um, but it happens at a late time, and so YE has already increased to about 0.3 or so, and so then when the material cools down again, it makes another R process, but the R process is sort of restarted at a Y of 0.3, and that's why we don't make any lanthanides or actinides in, in these cases. So let's switch back to the slides. Here we go. All right. All right, so in this corner up here, restarted R process and no lanthanides or actinides. Um, then at Y of 0.25, this is sort of the transition where we just sort of stop making lanthanides and actinides in most case in most cases, and you can see this in this panel up here. But the really striking thing is, if you look at the heating rate, it's actually very uniform, and that is because um, we are looking at the heating rate here at a specific time, namely one day, and so that means we'll always pick up nuclides that are decaying on the time scale of about a day, and as long as we have an ensemble of nuclides around that are decaying on about this time scale, we will always get about the same heating rate, you know, just for averaging of these sort of exponential decays. So as long as we have, you know, some ensemble of nuclides, it doesn't matter which nuclides exactly they are, but if we have some that decay on you know, time scale of a day, then the heating rate will be fairly uniform. Um, and then at very or non neutron rich symmetric matter, Y 0.5, we obviously don't make any R process. Uh, for any entropies or expansion time scales, but still the heating rate is fairly uniform for the, the same reason I just mentioned. Okay, so this was um, this was a parameter study. So we just said, okay, we, you know, we just picked an initial YE entropy and electron, uh, sorry, initial electron fraction entropy and expansion time scale, ran nucleus in the systems and looked at what happened. Now, David Radice has used these results to uh, look at nuclear synthesis in some of his actual binary neutron star simulations. And so he has a different, different types of neutrino transport mechanisms, and that will um, sort of change the YE distribution of the, of the dynamical ejecta. And in this case, the blue curve shows just hydro only, so no neutrino transport. And then obviously we just get very neutron rich ejecta. The red curve is a leakage scheme, so a fairly approximate neutrino transport scheme, but still it can raise to, uh, the electron fraction of a good part of the material up to about 0.3. And the black curve is just a slightly more sophisticated scheme that actually can push the distribution way, way up to 0.4. But we still have a large amount of mass at YEs of below 2.5, um, sorry, 0.25. And so that means we're going to get a superposition of a complete R process from the material below 0.25 and sort of an incomplete R process from the material above 0.25. And this is what we see on the right here. So as so the blue curve would be basically just only neutron rich material. We make the second, third peaks, not much in the, in the first peaks here. And then as we go to the trainers or the trainers distribution, sorry, by E distributions that are less neutron rich, then we sort of see the turn on of this first peak that comes from the, the incomplete R process part. 
And this is very similar to what other people have seen. So here's an example from Monayo and all in 14. Again, neutrino distribution goes from 0.1 to like 0.45. And then the final abundances we do make, or we, they do see the second and third peak and also this first peak that comes from the, the less neutron rich part. All right, so now let's switch gears. And the last thing I want to talk about in detail is uh, our nucleosynthesis in the neutron star black hole merger that uh, Luke and I performed together with uh, Matt Dewey and, and some others. And so here, basically what we did is Francois Foucault has run full GR simulations of neutron star black hole mergers. And then Matt Dewey at, at Washington State University, he took the ejecta from, or the tidal tails from, from the full merger simulation, mapped it into a smooth particle hydrodynamics code and then followed the ejecta to late times. And then in this code, we have tracer particles. And so then we get these tracer particles for that we can extract the uh, density versus time history. And then we also know the initial uh, YE and um, entropy of the distribution. And so that's all we need to run nucleosynthesis on it with Skynet. So here are some of the final abundances that we, that we obtained. And so, oh, I forgot to mention, so then what we did in the nucleosynthesis step, we just imposed a constant neutrino luminosity because you can sort of almost see it here. There's this accretion disk that forms around the black hole. It's pretty hot, so it emits some neutrinos, um, and then they can potentially have an impact on the nucleosynthesis that happens in the tidal tail ejecta. And so we just put in a constant neutrino luminosity and to vary the luminosity and see how the abundances change as a function of neutrino luminosity. And the abundances shown here are just the mass average abundances over all the, um, um, all the trajectories. And so you can see second and third peaks very robustly produced, but the big impact that the neutrino luminosity has as it goes from about two times 10 to the 51 in black to 2.5 times to the 53 uh, is it, enhances this first peak here. And so here we essentially found a new mechanism to enhance this first peak, and it's different than the mechanisms before where the YE distribution is shifted. And I will show you a plot of the Y distribution in just a moment. Um, but what happens here is um, when you look at the original NEC distribution of the material, the, most of the seed nucleates are clustered around a mass of 80 or so. That's already past the first peak. And so these seed nuclei, they will capture neutrons and then robustly produce the second and third peaks through fission cycle. But additionally, if we have neutrino radiation, as it gets stronger, we can convert some of the neutrons in the initial composition into protons, and then two protons and two neutrons can quickly come together and form helium-4, and then those, um, or these alpha particles, there's a neutron catalyzed triple alpha process that quickly converts these alpha particles that are being created into carbon-12, and then we have some additional, and these are additional low mass seed nuclei, and then these carbon-12, they will capture more neutrons, and they will then make the first peak. But the first peak is made without really affecting the second and third peaks, because in the same, like we do in the same sort of um, trajectory, we still make the second and third peak because it's very neutron rich, but we get this enhancement in the first peak through these additional low mass seed nuclei. And so this is different from where we have a superposition of incomplete and complete R process, as I shown you in the binary neutron star merger cases, because here the Y distribution actually doesn't go above 0.25, and this is shown here. So the plot on the right shows the new, the YE distribution of the ejecta. The blue one is just the original one, so it's all very neutron rich. And then as we turn on neutrino luminosity, we do shift the distribution to higher YE. And so the highest one shown here is, is the orange curve. And I apologize if that is a poor choice in color, but um, we only get a little bit of mass above 2.25. And so we do shift the YE distribution up, but only not, not sort of beyond 0.25, so we never get an incomplete R process, but we do get the enhancement in the first peak through these additional low mass C nuclei that are being produced um, sort of close to the, close to the disk, I presume, where um, or early on in, in the nucleosynthesis calculation where the neutrino uh, irradiation is strong. 
All right, and then just finally, I want to mention, um, so I, all this stuff I talked, uh, talked about so far is from the dynamically checked on, and uh, Luke and I are working right now on some nucleosynthesis and disk wins together with uh, Rodrigo Fernandez, but fortunately we don't have any results yet, so I'm just showing something from Just and uh, et al. Um, 2015. And so here on the left is the, you know, uh, the electron fraction distribution, and he's actually split it up by neutrino-driven wind, which is sort of the um, brown curve here where we don't have much mass below a y 0.23. And so from this, we would expect just sort of an incomplete R process. And that's shown on the right in, in the green curve. We, we still we see a little bit of third peak and maybe second peak, but mostly first peak um, abundances. And then the, the sort of the later outflow is the total is that it actually does go down to lower YE, so then you do make the second and third peaks as well. All right, so let me conclude, and these are the sort of take-home messages. So the first is, it's really clear now that from binary neutron star mergers or black hole neutron star merger, if we do get ejecta, we can very robustly produce the full R process, and by this I mean second and third peaks, through this fission cycling. Now in these cases, they don't, the first peak is sort of underproduced uh, relative to what we see from observations. But there's two, at least two, methods to enhance the first peak. And one is just you have some neutrino radiation which um, shifts the YE distribution to higher YE, and then you get this combination of incomplete R process, which reduces the first peak, and complete R process, which does not. Or this new method that, that we found where neutrino radiation does push up YE, but not to the point where you get this complete R process, but instead you make additional low mass seed nuclei, which then create the first peak. And for observations, which are, you know, I think going to be a really hot topic now because we have detected gravitational waves. And so soon we will be, we will also see gravitational wave signals from neutron star mergers. And then we really want to see those kilonovae. Um, but to model these accurately, uh, the, the amount of lanthanides and actinides in the ejector are very, really, really important. And generally speaking, if the initial electron distribution or electron fraction is below why you point 0.2 or 0.3, depending on the entropy and the expansion time scale, then we get always lots of lanthanide, so a dim red transient. Um, and there are these two exceptions where we get a neutron rich freeze out at high entropy and sort of very quick expansion, or we get this restarted R process at, um, that restarts at a higher YE if we initially have a very long expansion time scale. And so with this, I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you very much for this great talk. Um, so if you have questions, please write them in the chat or indicate in the chat to me uh, that you want to ask some questions. And I suggest that we start uh, with MSU because you are the most people. So yeah, please go ahead. OK, or Chuck starts because he has a question. Oh, you can hear me. Uh, yeah. uh, so I had a question with the black hole neutron star merger. What did you do for the anti-neutrino luminosity? For the anti-neutrino luminosity? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we just set the ratio of neutrino luminosity and anti-neutrino luminosity fixed at, I think, 0.15, which is what you expect from um, the delepinization. Or, sorry, that's not, that's not right. We don't have a... Habermas neutron star in that case, um, but yeah, that's that's what you ex expect from just the um, the disk, I suppose. So we uh, we set the ratio of luminosities uh, fixed, and then just change one luminosity. We also fix the um, uh, the ratio of of the mean energies there. So it's you know it's it's very approximate. So clearly, there we need more sophisticated higher simulations that will actually tell us what the true Luminosity, like neutrino and anti neutrino luminosities, are from those hot disks around uh, around the black hole. And then once we have that, um, we can you know see what, how it impacts the nuclear synthesis. Okay, Hendrik. Next question no, by Hendrik. No, now you hear me. Yes. 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 Hey, very great. <laughs> uh, I was wondering about this uh, new method to produce the first peak. It looked like the, the first peak abundances would, would still be quite below uh, from what you get from observations. Yeah. Um, 
And so is there a way to get this up with that method or does it then become sort of identical to uh, the other way to do it uh, with a significant YE change? Right. If you have too so, much neutrinos, then uh, it'll just yeah. be YE change. Exactly. So um, I think in the paper we have plots with slightly higher neutrino luminosity than uh, 2.5 times 10 to 53, and it actually saturates. Um, so at some point you get a neutrino luminosity where even if you increase it further, you don't get a further enhancement in this first peak. Um, and so I think we, we can clearly not produce sort of the relative abundance pattern of the first to second to third peak that, that are, you know, that we observe in, that, that we are observing. So it seems that, you know, binary black hole, or sorry, neutron star black hole mergers will not on their own be able to explain all the observed solar R process abundances. I think it's, it's clear that we do need neutron star mergers as well, where we have this wider YE distribution and get complete and incomplete R process. And perhaps it's you know, reasonable that there's also some contribution from core collapse supernovae, which because their YE is so high, they almost exclusively make an incomplete R process, but they, they could be perhaps the dominant contributor to the first peak. Okay. Okay, Sanjay has a question. A fraction of GRVs uh, actually show this uh, kilonova phenomena. Are you, sorry, did you ask what fraction? What fraction actually show this kilonova? Okay, well, this is probably far too early to tell because so far we've only, you know, potentially detected it in two cases. And it's really hard to detect, right? Because you need you need very quickly a good localization of those shear bees. And I mean, we're only talking about short shear bees here. Because from the gamma rays alone, you get a very rough localization. Then you really need to be able to find this afterglow, like in X-ray or, or optical. And then you have a good idea, okay, where it, where it is. And then you might have a chance to see the kilonova. But it's fairly dim and red. And I, we would expect and so it's really hard to see and I think as observations get better we will get an idea of what fraction of short gamma ray bursts have this kilonova. but sort of from the you know from this theory we would we would expect that all of them should show a kilonova because from our simulations of binary difference or mergers if they are indeed the generator of the short gamma ray bursts we would always expect to see some dynamical ejecta which would undergo our process and then produce a kilonova. But it's just, it's really hard to find. And so at this point, you know, from observations, we don't have it. We can't say whether it's all of them or, you know, some fraction that's not unity because we have a hard time detecting them. And we can't really say for sure that we, we didn't see it. Well, I guess there may be actually one case where um, we might have some pretty tight constraints that we didn't see a kilonova, but I don't know about this case in detail, unfortunately. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I was wondering if, you know, because this prediction is that you would see it in all neutron star mergers, is this, yeah. this is, is this a simple test which you can apply? Yeah, I, I think it will be in the future once we have, you know, once we are more routinely able to detect the kilonova and would also be able to say with confidence that, okay, we, we know, you know, we see the afterglow, so we know the event happened there, but we did not see a kilonova. And at this point, just observationally, we're not, we're not there yet. Okay, there was another question from uh, Beers. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yep, 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 yep. 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 Okay, good. Yeah, so I enjoyed your, your presentation. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you probably can anticipate what I'm curious about, which is the, these the direct ties to the lanthanides and the actinides. Um, and we've already seen one signature, which is yet to be explained in the observations, where roughly a third of the highly R process enhanced stars that we know of in the field show abnormally high uh, actinides. Mm -hmm. um, and two thirds are just mm -hmm. normal. And so the question is, is there any natural mechanism that you might think of that would uh, produce sort of a step function, two different varieties in the, in the uh, abundances of, of 
actinides in one scenario versus another scenario? Um, well, I guess. Um, um, well, I guess. Uh, oh, someone needs to mute their microphone again. Okay. Um, so I think we saw this very. Um, there's this critical value of YE, where basically if YE is below 0.25, you make the full R process and you make the actinides, and then very soon if you increase YE just a little bit and you go beyond this threshold, then the actinides and even lanthanides basically just go away almost immediately. And so, but then of course that would require some kind of mechanism that, you know, or I guess in this case, whenever you have, you, you sort of have two different ways or two different uh, channels to that produce our process elements sort of in the lower mass range and in one case you do make actinides as well in the other case you don't make any and the sort of transition is very abrupt so that you know that may almost be like the step function that they that you're thinking about um, but then you know there, then, you know, there's lots of other considerations with okay how does it actually mix with the intergalactic medium um, you know and there's, as I, as, as I alluded to at the beginning, there's these potential issues with neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers to explain the sort of the mixing and the spread in different, um, or spread or lack thereof of different R process elements that we see in, in various stars. Did that yeah, address? Okay, that's interesting. Did that address the question? Yeah, I think now um, I see Alex G is on the, uh, is on the, uh, the, the chat list and or at least he's on the attendee list and of course uh, he and uh, others recently published a, a paper on reticulum 2 with the interesting detection an ultrafaint dwarf galaxy with the interesting detection of highly r process enhanced stars in this particular location i think a lot of the issues that were raised in the past having to do with chemical time scales and mixing etc yeah, um, yeah, are now coming very clear because uh, one could defend the notion that we have seen the birthplace of highly R process and they stars, and what we see in the field is just when you tear up those birthplaces into their shreds. And so, um, since it's such a difficult measurement in the ultra faints, given the obvious faintness of the of the gal of the stars, um, doubling or tripling the numbers of field our process enhanced stars, which is something we're actively pursuing. We'll refine these fractions. How many have actinide boosts? How many don't? How many show uh, first peak anomalies? How many don't? All of those kinds of things become much easier. So, so observations are coming a long way. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And there's, I should also mention there's, you know, a huge sort of uncertainty in the initial coalescence time of binary neutron stars. You know, people say, you know, maybe if you're in a globular cross cluster, two neutron stars could could start out very close together and they could merge within like a million years or a few million years. And then suddenly, um, if you, you know, say that this is reasonable, then you can actually make all these R process elements very early on in, in the formation of a galaxy. Um, but they would still be sort of clustered events and you might, expect to see a big spread if you look at if you look at us yeah in fact i'll just interject one other comment and that is that uh, it's probably no coincidence that the metallicity interval where we find most all of the highly r process enhanced stars is the same metallicity interval i mean fe over h as we find for the ultra faint dwarfs so in other words it's been pointed out for almost a decade that there is this anomaly in the distribution of FE over H. Hmm. And now I think we understand why, because that's where they're born. So, so I think a lot of these issues are, are gonna be resolved fairly quickly. Okay, are there any more questions? Otherwise there was a comment at MSU. Can you hear me, Ingo? Yeah. Yes. Um, I just wanted to remind all of you um, that there is the deadline, uh, submission deadline for the Frontiers meeting this weekend already, even the extended deadline. So it would be great if you contribute your talks or posters there before the weekend is over. We would be very happy to see you all there. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you.
So if there are not, uh, uh, yeah, no more questions, uh, let's thank again Jonas for his great talk. And yeah, let's see each other in two weeks then for the next seminar. Thank you.